Welcome back to another episode of the Daily Wisdom Words Podcast, where every week we talk to folks who have stories, advice, and life hacks, all of which take you one step closer to that feeling of hope. I'm your host, Neil Chiretti, and today I'm so proud to be joined by trauma educator and nervous system junkie, as a lot of her tags say, the one and only coach, Lindsay Lockett. Hey, Lindsay, welcome to the show. Hi, Neil. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so sorry. I didn't realize this was going to be on video and I look like I just rolled out of bed, but here we are. <laughs> oh, you look fine. <laughs> You're good. Thanks. You look good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I know that you do a lot of work. You have a practice, which we'll get into on the nervous system and you you educate people on trauma and so much. So, can you explain a little bit of your background? Now, I know reading from your on your website that you're not one of those woe is me people. Like you're, you're like, okay, I'll tell you my bio and all that. But just so people get a sense of where you're coming from and why this is so important to you. Can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So um, yeah, I'm definitely not woe is me now, but there was a time in my life when I was woe is me um, because I had an extremely dysregulated nervous system due to the environment in which I grew up, um, the dysregulation of my own parents, <laughs> um, the, yeah. their, their lack of emotional availability or intelligence, um, growing up in fundamentalist evangelical Christianity, like all uh, of that, like just, it just sort of climaxed in my mid thirties. You know, I had the proverbial cliche midlife crisis and, basically like everything was going wrong in my life. And it was a huge wake up call from the universe, um, that I could not continue living. Like, not that I was living in a dysfunctional way or like my life was super unhealthy. I, it was actually the opposite where I was on what I call the hamster wheel of wellness, like constantly trying to get better, trying to treat my chronic and mysterious symptoms with really crazy healing diets and lots of supplements and stuff like that. Um, but what I realized after my dark night of the soul, it was like this epiphany where I was like, if those things had been what I needed to be, well, I would have been well because I was doing them like the best, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that was a huge wake up call for me. And it allowed me to give myself permission to step outside of that paradigm. And it's not that I don't believe that you know, nourishing foods and a supportive diet and helpful supplements can't be great for people, but oftentimes that's where we start and it's where we stop. And yeah. then, then whenever it's not working, we're like, oh, I must be taking the wrong supplement or it must be the wrong strain of probiotics, or it's, I, I'm, I'm probably allergic or sensitive to these other mystery foods that I haven't figured out yet. You know, like I did that, I played yeah. that game for like a decade and it's exhausting. Um, it, oh, yeah. it formed, uh, an, an eating disorder for me. Like it manifested as the eating disorder of yeah. orthorexia, where I was like literally afraid of quote unquote, unclean foods. Um, yeah. and yeah, I just was micromanaging my body all the time. And uh -huh. then I attempted suicide in March of 2019 and I checked Ooh. myself into the psych hospital um, voluntary stay for five days, got on some much needed medication at that point because I had not slept in about five months. And, um, yeah, while I was in the hospital, I didn't have access to all the healing things that I had access to at home, like all my special food and all my special supplements and all my healing devices and, you know, my infrared light and my blue light blockers and like all those things, right. I didn't have access to any of that because I was in the psych hospital. Um, I wasn't even allowed to wear shoes there. So like, Oh, really? Yeah, wow. because they don't want you to hang yourself with your shoelaces. <laughs> oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> um, wow. Okay. I didn't even have my own cell phone there. Like, they literally, yeah. like, that's that's what you get into when you check yourself into a psych ward. So, yeah, I didn't have access to all those things that I truly thought I needed to be okay. And I had to eat hospital food, and I was taking pharmaceutical medications, and, like, and I wasn't getting any worse. So that was kind of my epiphany where I was like, well... 
if I had needed those things to be well, then you would think that in the absence of those things, I would have been more sick or I would have gotten worse or something, but I actually didn't. So that was my wake up call for like finally stepping off the hamster wheel of wellness. I dove into the world of the brain, the limbic system and the autonomic nervous system. And I am still very much in that world, still, um, still learning and, you know, experimented on myself first and then just started an Instagram account in June of 2020. Um, not, not to start a business or anything because at the time I had a very successful food blog. Um, and right. so I wasn't trying to start a business when I started my Instagram account. I mostly just wanted a place to document like the changes that I was making in my own life. And yeah. so that's what I did. And obviously people started following me and not even three years later, we're, you know, 41,000 people <laughs> right. in and I have a podcast and I run group coaching programs. I do one-on-one -on -one coaching and I teach workshops and I absolutely love all of it. I feel like this is what I was put on this earth to do in this lifetime. And, um, yeah, it's, it's amazing. I, I wake up every day, just like in awe that this is my life, it, when, especially whenever mm -hmm. it was so dark before. You know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. What would you say? Was there one? I'm sure as you did your research after that epiphany time, um, I'm sure you must as you must have learned so much, obviously, to do what you do now. Uh, you so much information. Are there one or two key misconceptions that perhaps you and everyone else had about the body and the nervous system and how mental health affects it? Is there one or two big misconceptions that got cleared up? And if so, what are the, what are a couple of things that really surprised you as you started researching? That is a great question. Such a fun question. So the biggest one that's sticking out to me, like right off the top of my head is that in wellness culture, um, and when I say wellness culture, I mean like people who are, you know, very into like healing diets and, um, supplements and like biohacking, you know, um, yeah. they're doing, they're doing like infrared saunas and coffee enemas and celery juicing and, you know, all those things. And so, so that was the world that I was in. And in that yeah. world, there is a huge emphasis on gut health. The gut right. is the Holy grail of health. All health begins in the gut. Yeah. And I'm not going to say that's wrong. Like, I don't think it's wrong. I do think gut health is very, 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 very important. However, right. when we've addressed the gut, meaning we've like done all the, the foods for gut health, we've eliminated the processed foods and maybe gluten and maybe dairy, and we've added in like bone broth and probiotics and fermented foods and, you know, grass fed meats and healthy fats. And like, we've done all of that. We've done cleanses, we've detoxed our livers, we've done castor oil packs, like we've done all these things to like nourish and nurture our guts. And then we still have symptoms, like then what? Because that's exactly where I was. And like the practitioner I was working with at the time was like, you probably have a stealth pathogen. So I was on stealth pathogen protocols. Um, like we need to do like a crazy parasite cleanse. So then I did that. And then we did like the coffee enemas to support my liver, to detox my liver. And then we were doing all the gut things on top of it. And I wasn't getting better. And, right. but I truly thought I was doing the right thing. Um, yeah. So what, I, I guess the biggest revelation I would say is not that gut health isn't important, but in wellness culture, what I find, and to this day is still true, and I've now been out of it for like three years, almost four years, is that everyone's talking about the gut and nobody's talking about the brain and the nervous system. And uh, right. so, so it's not that, that gut health is the most important thing is, is wrong. Well, I mean, it is wrong. I don't think gut health is the most important thing. Gut health is important, but it's not more important than the brain and the nervous system. Right. Like th those are important too. And when people understand the brain and the nervous system, then you see that the autonomic nervous system is actually controlling everything that's going on in the gut anyway. Right. So like, like, like something like 80% or 60% of our vagus nerve has endings in the gut, right? Well, the vagus right. nerve is not technically part of your digestive system. It's part of your autonomic nervous system. So, right. so that's why like a lot of people with trauma have 
coexisting morbidities with, they have gut issues, they have IBS, they have Crohn's disease, they have ulcerative colitis, they have all kinds of food intolerances. They're either really bloated or really constipated. Uh, I'm sorry, they either like have re- like diarrhea or they're really constipated, they're bloated. Um, they have heartburn, indigestion, like stuff like that. Yeah. So you would think in, in health and wellness world, like you would, you would attack that by, you know, eliminating the air quote offending foods, which you could be on a search for a lifetime trying to figure out what those are. Um, you could, you know, be on $400 of supplements a month. You could be constantly experimenting with different strains of probiotics. You could do bone broth fasting, which I did. You could do coffee enemas. You could do all the things and you can still have these gut issues. And then that makes you feel like a failure or it makes you feel really hopeless. Whereas when people start to dabble in the world of the brain and the nervous system, their gut issues often really improve or even resolve because they actually went upstream to where the the problem is to begin with. And so I do believe that dysregulation of our nervous systems and inflammation in our brains trickles down and it absolutely affects the gut. I do not believe that the gut is the holy grail of health. I believe that the nervous system and the brain are. Yeah, yeah. I believe the analogy usually uses the spider's web where everything is connected, sort of, yeah. right? Yeah, like, Can totally. you explain that a little for those who may not be familiar with that analogy of yours? Yeah, so that's a really interesting and fun analogy. So uh, in 2020, you know, we were all locked down at home. Um, it was a really nourishing time for me. Like I felt like I was like built for the pandemic. I know that wasn't the case for everyone, but for me, it was, it was a great time. Um, I felt like I was cocooned in, in my little healing cocoon and I just got to explore so many things. Um, and so in the beginning of 2020, I had this sense that my purpose in life was changing and that I wasn't as in love with the food blog as I was before. And I really just felt like, you know, this has been fun and everything, but this is not what I see myself doing going forward. Like that felt like a past version of myself and what she did. And I was like becoming this whole different person. And so in the summer of 2020, I'd been sort of sitting with this idea of like, I don't know what I'm going to do about my food blog. I don't know what I'm going to do to make a living. I really want to do something with trauma and the nervous system, but I don't know what that's going to look like. So I did acid. (laughs) And um, I just, I just did some LSD and, um, and my intention going into that was like universe, God source, please show me in this altered state of consciousness, what my next step is that I'm not getting in my present state of consciousness. Right. And the imagery that the universe used that day was the spider's web. And so like, basically from the, that morning, even before I took the LSD, I, when I do a psychedelic trip, I kind of have like my space, like prepared. So my house is usually very clean. I have like some snacks for myself, tea, stuff like that. Well, that morning, it was very important to me that I water my plants. <laughs> so I was, uh, I was watering all my plants. I came down into my office to water the plants down here. And I looked up on the wall and there was a spider just on the wall. And mm. which is interesting in, in most places, that's not like uncommon, but I live in Minnesota where it's very, very cold. And so a spider on the wall in the summertime is something that is noteworthy. I'll just say that it's just noteworthy. Right. right? Um, because we never see spiders on our walls. So, and it felt significant to me. And normally like when there's a spider or a bug on the wall, I see it, I go take my shoe off and I hit it. And then I clean up the guts and move on. And that day I was like, this seems significant. Like, I'm just going to leave that spider there, <laughs> you know? Um, so I did. And so that was kind of the, that was even before I took the LSD. And then after I took the LSD, I mean, freaking spider webs were like everywhere. Wow. And, um, it like the whole day I, there was just spider webs everywhere. And my husband and I went for a walk in the woods that day and came across a dragonfly that was caught in a spider's web. And the dragonfly was already dead and there was not a spider in the web, but I just stopped on the walk and I just like crouched down and I stared at this dragonfly and I just started crying. And my husband was like, are you okay? Do you need something? And I was like, no, I just, I just identify with this dragonfly so much. And he was like, in what way? And I was like, well, 
like, look at this web. Like it tore this web up fighting to get out and it still didn't get out. Like it tried so hard. And like, that's how I had felt for so much of my life is like, I was just, I would get stuck. And then I would just try so hard that I would exhaust myself. Um, And I I just like identified with the feeling of being stuck and fighting and fighting and resisting and resisting. And, you know, it hasn't killed me yet, but like, I think if I would have kept going on the path I was going, it it would have. Um, So that was a story from that day. Another time there was a blanket laid out in our yard and I sat on the blanket and right next to me, there was a spider. I mean, it was just all day long. And finally at the end of the day, I was like, okay, universe, like, what does all this mean? And basically the universe was just like, like what makes us up as human beings is it's like a spider's web. And it's like, if you think about the way a traditional spider's web looks, it has these uh, parts that attach to like a tree or a fence post or a gate or something like that. And then it spins its web around and then it, it waits, right? It's, it sits and it waits. It doesn't have to go out and find what nourishes it. It just spins a web and it waits for the nourishment to come. And if at any point the web gets, you know, torn or ripped or the wind blows it or something like the spider doesn't have to tear down the whole web and start over. They can just go to that part of the web and repair that part of the web. And then they go back to their sitting and waiting to be nourished. Mm -hmm. And the universe was like, the things that make up your web as a human are all these parts of your being, like your physical body, your mental state, your emotional state, your ancestry and your spirituality. Those are all like, that's what you're weaving your web around, right? Like those are the parts of you. Okay, if you think yeah. about it, when a spider weaves her web, like she doesn't then go out and look at other spiders and like criticize their web or try to destroy their web or, you know, like something like that. She just like maintains her own web. She's like, this is what is my responsibility to maintain. I don't have to maintain, you know, that spider over there or that spider over there. Like we're not in competition with each other. Like we're all just weaving our own web and doing our thing. And that's kind of the other, um, the other meaning that the spider's web has for me is like, it's just my reminder to like, just weave my own web, just like tend to myself, tend, tend to what's my business don't worry about what all these other people out here are doing. Don't worry about this other account on Instagram. Don't worry about this person over here. Don't worry if, if this person has more followers than you or whatever, like tend yeah. your own web. Like that's what you right. need to worry about is your, what you're spinning in your own life, what you're weaving in your own life. So it kind of has multiple meanings for me, but that's the gist of it. We, we hear a lot about the regulation of the nervous system and that how a huge part of it. What exactly happens when that goes off? When it's dysreg, uh, is it deregulation or dysregulation when it's not regulated? Yeah, I say dysregulation. Um, someone yeah. could also say like activation. Um, yeah. So, so basically the simplest way that I could describe that would be that first and foremost, our nervous systems are not meant to be regulated all the time. So for anyone who's like coming into the nervous system world and they're like, I just need a bunch of tools and information for how to regulate my nervous system and keep myself regulated. That is an unrealistic goal (laughs) because (laughs) life, life, right? Life happens and your nervous system is meant to respond to danger or what, what is perceived as danger, right? So you don't want a nervous system that's like not responsive You want a nervous system that responds appropriately to whatever the stressor is. So when when we, you know, are walking through the woods and we come across a bear in the woods, like without thinking about it, without forcing it to happen, without pushing a button, without taking a pill, our bodies automatically will, um, our pupils will dilate, our breathing will become shallow, our heart rate will increase and our muscles will tense up. And that's because our body is preparing to mobilize us. That's what sympathetic activation means. That's your fight flight response. It's movement energy. And the body needs a lot of energy in the muscles, in the blood flow. Um, So the digestion shuts down, reproductive urges and sexual desire shuts down. Like, because all the body is focused on at that point is, am I going to fight this bear or am I going to run away from this bear? Because either way, I need all of this energy to do that, right? Yeah. 
When Correct. our fight flight response, when our nervous system and our brain determine that our fight flight response has not worked in service of our survival or to get us back to safety, the only other option is what's known as immobilization. So if people are familiar with the freeze response, um, that would be, it, it's more technically, it would be referred to as immobilization because immobilization kind of occurs on a spectrum. So like freeze is not total shutdown. I can't move at all. Freeze is actually a state, a mixed state where you have the mobilization energy of the fight flight response, but you're also down the polyvagal ladder into immobilization territory. So it's like you have the gas and the brakes pushed at the same time. Right. Um, the, the state of freeze is commonly like if people are having really extreme anxiety, panic attacks, um, stuff like that, that's the state of freeze. And then as we go further down in mobilization, that's when we get into like collapse and shutdown. Um, so those are like people that are really depressed, really dissociated, can't get out of bed are you know, zoning out on their phones and scrolling a lot, um, stuff like that. So that's kind of a brief explanation of, um, the states of the nervous system, according to polyvagal theory by Stephen Porges. Um, yeah. so the goal is not to have a totally regulated nervous system all the time. The goal is to be able to flexibly move up and down through those various states when it's appropriate, and then quickly come back to safety when the threat is over. If our nervous systems are not doing that because we get stuck in chronic dysregulation, that's when we see the, like the dysfunctional aspects of our lifestyles, like, um, the addiction, the insomnia, we get diagnosed with mental illnesses, um, stuff like that. I don't actually believe that mental illness is real. I believe that all mental illness is a symptom of nervous system dysregulation. So, um, cause it's not in the mind, right. It's in the body. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. did that answer your question about, um, kind it, of, no, the- it, it did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, so yeah, if we get into that, like you, you talk about, well, first, I guess, before we talk about like life hacks and things that you recommend and we'll, from there, we'll go on to a little bit about your practice, but you put up this very interesting post where at least it was very interesting to me on Instagram and that is listening to your body. Mm. And I thought that was fascinating because I had not seen anyone explain it the way you do. They talk about it. There are a lot of people saying, listen to your body, listen to your body, but they never really get into, okay, but what does that mean? And you explained that. So can you, can you explain that a little bit uh, for our audience? Yeah, absolutely. That's such a great question. I too used to like roll my eyes at Instagram therapy and coaching when people are like, just listen to your body. And I'm like, (laughs) what the fuck are you talking about? I don't even know what that means. So, um, so we have actually eight senses. So we have our sight, smell, taste, touch, and hearing. Those are the five main senses that all of us are familiar with. We have three other senses beyond those five main senses. We have the sense of proprioception, which is where our body is in space. We have our vestibular Mm -hmm. sense, And then we have the sense of interoception and interoception is the sense of being able to notice and feel inside your body. So when you notice that you have a headache, you are interocepting because you are noticing and feeling that this is what's happening. I have this sensation that I would describe as a headache. Um, Same if, if you just happen to notice that your stomach is loudly digesting your food and it's grumbling and rumbling and making lots of noise, that's also interoception. You are noticing and feeling what's going on inside your body. Interoception right. is how we listen to the body. So we experience sensation and sensation yeah. is the language that our bodies speak. Our bodies do not speak in words. They speak in sensation. Yeah. Our sensations are sometimes like basic care needs. For instance, the sensation of hunger is to alert you. Your nervous system is alerting you. Hey, it's time to eat. So you have the sensation of hunger and you know, it's time to eat. Same with like the sensation of sleepiness, right? The nervous system is like, Hey, it's getting late. You're tired. Melatonin is increasing. Cortisol is decreasing. You're sleepy. So you know, to go get in bed and go to sleep. Yeah. Some of our sensations also correlate with our emotions. So for example, if you have a lot of anxiety in response to like public speaking, for example, 
Like, so you have a fear of public speaking and your body is letting you know that that fear is present. And maybe you have a knot in your throat and like a sick feeling in your stomach. Right. Right. Um, right. Or like when you get really embarrassed and your face turns bright red, that is a sensation that correlates with the emotion of humiliation and embarrassment or shame. Yeah. Right. So the way that we listen to the body is through interoception, by noticing our sensations. Humans, though, are the only species on Earth that also have an ego. <laughs> and so true. what happens is, is we're not just noticing and feeling. We're not just interocepting. We're interocepting, and then we have these sneaky voices in our heads that we would call ego. And they then tell stories, and they make meaning out of these sensations that we're feeling. So as an extreme example, if someone has health anxiety um, yeah. or hypochondria is what it used to be called, um, which I really hate that word because it's so stigmatized, but let's, let's call it health anxiety. So every time they feel something in their bodies, they, it, they're so sensitive to it that their interoception is like turned all the way up, right? And right. that they have anxiety because they don't know why they feel what they feel. Yeah. So for example, when I had really bad health anxiety, I had the symptoms of a urinary tract infection for like five months. I went to the doctor mm -hmm. four times. I had my urine tested four separate times. It never cultured bacteria. So they could never tell me that I actually had a urinary tract infection, but I kept right. having the pain, the spasming, the frequent need to urinate, all of that. By the time I actually saw a urologist and got a formal diagnosis for what was going on, I was convinced that I had bladder cancer. Like mm. that's what my health wow. anxiety told me. My health anxiety, it, anxiety is always looking for certainty, right? So yeah. people with health, people with health anxiety, they feel these sensations in their bodies that are very alarming to them. And then they get on Google and they're like, you know, WebMD all day long. And by the, by the end of the day, they've got like brain cancer and, you know, Alzheimer's or something. So, yeah. you know, and, and really they may just have a headache, you know? Yeah. Um, but, but that's, that's that heightened, like really heightened interoception. The flip side of that is like dissociation where somebody's like, I can't even tell you what I feel inside my body because they're so disconnected from their bodies that they've like shut it off and they don't want to yeah. feel what's going on down here. Right. Yeah. Either way though, whether, whether you don't want to be in the body and you don't want to interocept and feel what's going on there, or your interoception is like turned all the way up and you're crazy sensitive, either way, there's a voice in the head. And if, if people listening, like want to pay attention, like have the intention to notice the voice in your head, the next time you feel a sensation in your body, right. that voice is like lightning fast. It will immediately be like, Oh, you have brain cancer. Oh, this, this probably means that your chronic illness is back. You have an autoimmune disease, like, because it's trying to make cert be certain, right? Yeah. It's, it would right. rather be certain that the worst possible scenario is happening than not know what's happening. Exactly. So it, it creates these stories to try to find certainty and meaning. Then the problem, because most people are not aware of the voice in their head. So when you're not aware of the voice in your head, you are unconsciously believing what that voice says, which drives the anxiety even further. Right. Right. Yeah. So it's noticing the sensation in the body is interoception. Then yeah. noticing the story in your head, the voice in your head that is trying to make meaning, trying to diagnose it, trying to fix it, control it, whatever. And yeah. then just being present with that feeling. So if someone, you know, has health anxiety and they get a headache, instead of going to Google and trying to be on WebMD all day, figuring out what the reason is behind the headache, if they could just like place their hands where their head hurts and just uh, no notice that sensation and just feel it, right? it's not a guarantee that it's going to go away, but that's not the point. The point of listening to the body is not to fix symptoms. The point right. of listening to the body is to be present with whatever's happening in the body instead of getting carried away by this voice in the head that is creating these wild and crazy stories that are very often really scary, right? Yeah. <clears throat> um, totally. So hopefully that answered your question. <laughs> yeah. Do you, is it interlinked with, because I've heard from other, like even my counselor suggests this, that 
if you increase mindfulness practices with other things, like say, okay, if you're cooking, I'm cooking potatoes, but that will also help like increase the mindfulness with the health or what's wrong. Does that, does that, is that correlation in there that if you have basic mindfulness practices, just of generally being aware in the moment, will that also correlate with what you're talking about? I mean, I, I can never say that having awareness of what's going on in the present moment is going to be like the thing that fixes right. whatever no. discomfort yeah. people are feeling. But yes, I mean, I actually just posted a reel about this the other day, like nervous systems heal in slowness. Our right. culture is a very fast paced, hustling, busy culture. Yeah it takes a toll on our nervous systems. So anytime we slow down, whatever it is that we're doing, even if it's something as simple as making a cup of tea, like if you mm -hmm. slow down and you don't have to be like, okay, now I am opening the tea bag and now I am putting the tea bag <laughs> in the cup. Like it doesn't have to yeah. be like that. It can no. be like just slowing down to make the cup of tea, noticing if your breath could be deeper, right? Like, could you increase right. the capacity of your breath just while you're making that cup of tea? Um, yeah. it's the simple things done slowly and with mindful intention. That is an excellent way to take care of our nervous systems. It's a free yeah. way we can take care of our nervous systems. And yeah. I, I personally cannot talk about the nervous system without also talking about awareness because our yeah. nervous systems, like we get stuck in these chronic fight, flight, or immobilized states, don't know how to get out of them. The mind is like gone off the rails, creating all these kinds of stories. And pretty soon you've got someone who's like, I can't get out of bed. I can't do anything. I feel completely numb. I'm depressed. I can't stop scrolling. I have chronic pain all the time and I can't sleep like yeah. all these different symptoms. And they don't want to feel any of those. I get it. Nobody wants to feel any of those things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But if we didn't feel those things, how else would our body let us know that something's wrong? Exactly. The yeah. body's not going to like call us and be like, Hey, nope. so there's something wrong. And like, I've made, all, I've made all these like millions of micro adjustments for you, like all day trying to maintain a state of homeostasis and allostasis. Like I've done all these things for you. And because you haven't listened to me now, I'm like calling you to remind you that I need you to take care of this. Like that's not how the body lets us know that there's something wrong. Our body right. let us know that there's something wrong through sensation and symptoms and every yeah. symptom that we've ever had started as a sensation. And right. when we, when we don't listen to the body, when it whispers, the body has no choice, but to scream. So by the time Very our true. bodies are screaming, our nervous systems are like off the charts, dysregulated. It takes time to come back to a baseline from that. There is no yeah. overnight quick fix nervous system regulation. It is a process and a practice. Um, yeah. and people do need to practice it because the reel that I posted this morning, um, it's like anything you practice, you can get good at, right? Like, like when you yeah. brush your teeth every morning, you don't have to relearn how to brush your teeth. That habit right. is ingrained. You probably brush your teeth the same way every day for the same amount of yeah. time at, on average. Right. Yeah. That's because our bodies and our brains are really, really efficient and they're efficient because we have neural pathways in our brains. And when we repeat something over and over, a neural pathway gets formed in our brain so that then we can do that thing, like brush our teeth without having to relearn it every time. It's really yeah. efficient, right? It uses less energy. Right. It takes a lot more energy to have to learn something new. So yeah. you brush your teeth. It's habit. You don't have to think about it. You can like brush your teeth and be on your phone at the same time and like getting your kids up for school and you're still doing it habitually and it's not a problem. Yeah. Awareness and nervous system regulation can be that easy, but you have to commit to the practice so that you can form those neural pathways. And so at first it is a new skill. It is something that takes time. You may find it frustrating. You may forget all of that is yeah. totally normal, but again, we have to go back to the voice in the head. So when someone is learning the practice of awareness and they keep forgetting, or they don't come into awareness or whatever, the voice in the head, that sneaky ego will latch onto that and will start to create a story. You're never going to yeah. get better. You're never going to be able to do this. Oh, that, that works for everyone else, but it doesn't work for me. Right. Those stories yeah. again. Whereas if we notice the story and we have the same level of presence with the story as we have with whatever it was that we were trying to get good at, 
right? So it's, it becomes like awareness and presence that like unfolds. There's another story. You can have awareness and presence about that. It unfolds. It's like, it keeps unfolding on itself, you know, and it can go, right. in, it can go infinitely deep. Like you there, you'll never run out of ways to be aware of that voice in your head because the voice in the head is always going to move on to the next thing and try to make meaning we do out that. of it. Can we take a couple of the, I, as we say, life hacks in our intro, right? Hacking that you've explained on your social media platforms. Like, and one of them I know is the cold plunge. So what are the benefits of that? Oh my gosh, there's such great benefits for cold plunges. Um, I mean, physiologically, the benefits are that it can rev up your metabolism. It can help you sleep better. It can reduce inflammation and pain in the body. Um, cold plunges are great physiologically. Like if you're, if you're looking for a way to improve your health and you don't want to change your diet and take a bunch of supplements, start doing cold plunges. <laughs> like really, um, <laughs> not that the diet isn't important. I still want to say it's yeah. important, but I think that the cold plunges for the nervous system and for our mental health, to me, those benefits even outweigh the physical body benefits. <laughs> um, so if you think about it, when you were a child or when you were in what you would consider to be a traumatic event or situation or something, right. especially if you were a child, you did not have agency to be able to fight back against your caregivers or to run away from home. So your fight flight response was like, this is not working in service of safety and survival. So right. a, lot of, a lot of children end up learning how to fawn and freeze in order to survive in their homes of origin. Yeah. And then they get out into the world and they're like dissociated and they can't figure their life out and they feel purposeless and meaningless and tired and sick. And then they wonder why, right? right? It's like their body is in a chronic sh state of immobilization. Yeah. So immobilization or mobilization doesn't really matter. I'm just using that as an example, but what I love about one of the things I love about cold plunges so much is that, a, it's a way that we can intentionally expose ourselves to stress because cold is stressful for the body. Yeah. We do not need to be safe and have no stress all the time. A, right. nervous, a nervous system that never has stress is not going to be a flexible, resilient nervous system. So yeah. when we expose ourselves intentionally to stressors, feel whatever it is that we're feeling and then regulate ourselves through it, we are actually widening our window of tolerance to stress. Right. When we were children or even sometimes as adults, we don't always have control over when we're in stress and when we're not. Sometimes we're just in it, right? So yeah. doing something that's intentionally stressful and doing it mindfully is actually a way to increase your capacity to handle more stress. So I love right. cold plunges for that reason. It can help people increase their tolerance to stress. Second yeah. thing I love about cold plunges, when we were children or in adult relationships or whatever, where we couldn't fight back and we couldn't leave, we may not have had agent, like the agency to do that. So yeah. cold plunges are actually another way to get your agency back and use your agency because not only are you using your agency to intentionally expose yourself to stress, but then you're also using your agency to say, okay, I'm done. I'm done being in this stress, right? So right. it's a great way yeah. for people to reclaim their power because they're choosing when they're going to be stressed out and they're choosing when they're done. Yeah. And when someone recognizes that they have that much agency over, you know, something as simple as a cold plunge, it can be really powerful because then that translates outside the water where you can yeah. be like in a stressful, exactly. you can be in a stressful conversation with someone and maybe you can stay longer than you could before, but you uh, also have access to your agency and you can go, you know what? I'm not having this conversation anymore. I know when to leave. Yeah. And uh, one more thing I thought is, I found interesting is a psychological sigh. Mm. So physiological, 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 physiological. Sorry. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you explain what that is real quick? Yeah, for sure. So phys a physiological sigh is something that our bodies naturally do. Um, it is a way that our parasympathetic nervous systems kick on to signal safety and bring us back to a state of safety. So right. 
if you think about it, when you've been crying really hard mm -hmm. on, on your own, your body will start to go, <sighs> yeah. right? That's how you would naturally, yeah. like when you've been crying, that's a physiological yeah. sigh. So your body naturally does that. It's a reflex that your body already has. But when you are in what I call a nervous system emergency, um, or like an, oh, oh shit, nervous system moment when you're like, I need a tool that is going to bring me back to safety really quickly. <laughs> um, the physiological side, it's great. You just make yourself do what your body would naturally do whenever you cry. So it would be like inhale through the nose, pause, another inhale through the nose, and then a long, slow exhale out the mouth. So since this is on video, it's great. I will demonstrate. So it's like this. And you can just repeat that for as many times as you need to. Wow. That's yeah, it's free. Well, it's, you can do it anywhere. Like, you know, if you're at work or something, go to the bathroom and do it or close your office door. But yeah, most, most of the time, what I find is that everything that we need to regulate our own nervous systems, we already have, um, we don't need devices yeah. and, and equipment and tools and gadgets and all the things like we yeah. need to be shown just simple tools and ways that we can move our bodies and use our breath to bring ourselves back to safety. And that's primarily what I teach in my work as well. Yeah. So let's get into it. Tell us about your practice and how people can check it out. What exactly, what are some of the things you offer and so on and so forth? Yeah. So, um, I offer a lot of things, but for simplicity's sake, I will just keep it to the nervous system, um, here for your show. So, um, I teach a really groundbreaking foundational workshop called nervous system 101. Um, okay. you can get it anytime from my website. It is a two hour long workshop where I dive into so much more than what I've even talked about here. Um, what the autonomic nervous system is, what it does, what happens whenever, um, like we experience trauma, like how we get chronically dysregulated, how that impacts and inflames our brains, how to heal brain inflammation, um, how to recognize if we're in fight or flight or freeze, or if we're fawning. Um, so nervous system 101, that's my foundational workshop. I have had other coaches take this workshop. I've had therapists, I've had psychologists take this workshop and tell me that I taught them information that they did not learn in grad school. So I know, I know that it is a damn good information heavy workshop. So anyone who's yeah. wanting information on the nervous system, even if it wasn't my own workshop, I would still tell you to check it out because it really is fantastic. Of course, I'm on Instagram. My profile is at I am Lindsay Lockett. Um, I also am the host of the Holistic Trauma Healing Podcast. Um, yes, tell us about like, yeah, where can people <laughs> listen to that? Because yeah. I just discovered it recently and it was like, oh, wow, this is amazing. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, Holistic Trauma Healing is anywhere that you can listen to podcasts. So it's on Apple, Spotify, Anchor, um, Google Podcasts, like pretty much anywhere you listen to podcasts, it's free. It has no ads. Um, topics covered range from religious trauma to mother wounding to addiction and alcoholism. Uh, there's a lot of spiritual stuff on there where we talk about like plant medicine and, uh, spirituality. There's a few episodes about astrology. There's, um, episodes about the inner child. Like it's, it's a pretty general widespread gamut of topics on, on my show. <laughs> Right. Well, Lindsay, this has been a fantastic conversation and really enjoyed it. So thank you so much for doing this. I, I can feel this episode is going to be one of those bigger ones when it comes Aww. out. So thank yeah, you, Neil. I sure. appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks, well, Neil. have a great day. You and too. Really enjoyed this. Thank you. Me too.